All right, we're going to dig right into Psalm 77 here. If you want to look down in your Bibles there at verse number 1. The Bible says, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. And there are still similar themes throughout this psalm, as we've seen in other psalms. But again, we, we've, I brought this up in the past, and I just want to point it out again in that first verse, where it says, I cried unto God with what? With my voice. Uh, even unto God with my voice. And we ought to have time. And, and you know, I think in American culture, especially um, I know this is how I was raised. You know, people have a tendency to pray to God very silently. And, and I do too. I, I pray to God in my heart very frequently. But we don't want to get away from just speaking to God and like calling out to God. And when you do, you could do a whole study on this. And it's pretty interesting how frequently people are, it, it's pretty evident and very clear that people are praying to God audibly with their voice out loud making their requests known to God and actually speaking to God even though we know God can he knows the thoughts of our heart and and that doesn't mean that you can't pray that way of course those situations work but we don't want to make that just the norm and the standard all the time when we pray that it's always just this silent thing in our heart it 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 resonates more when you can speak things out loud. Um, it doesn't mean it's any more real necessarily. Of course, what, what you feel in your heart, what you think in your heart is real as well. But we see a lot mentioned about this in Scripture. And I just want to make sure that we're all thinking about that and know like, hey, look, this is saying I cried unto God with my voice. Like, why would you even have to add that? Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of references in Scripture about the same type of thing. He's saying, look, I cried unto God with my voice. We know that, for example, Daniel, uh, when they made the law against praying to the Lord and, and not going to the king first and not getting permission first before you can make any type of prayer or intercession, he prayed out loud with his mouth. And, and if you think about that specifically, he could have very easily just prayed in his heart. And then no one would know for sure what he was doing, right? You could be like, oh, they passed this law, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray three times a day like I always have, but I'll just now, instead of opening up my mouth, I'm just going to pray in my heart. And then if someone sees me, how can they prove that I'm praying? I'm just resting on my knees or whatever, right? Like, like no one would know. And, and, but that's not what Daniel did, of course. And I don't believe that's what he should have done either. Uh, you know, boldly just praying. And, and it, he wasn't trying to make a point either. It just says that he went just as he had in the past. He didn't change his schedule. That law being passed didn't make him have to try to hide what he was doing. He just did exactly what he had always done. He didn't even close his window. He just, just go and, and as, as always... As he normally would have done, he continued to do the same thing. And again, there's something to be said for that. There's something to be said for being able to speak with your voice out loud and pray. And especially in a, God, a culture that's turning more and more godless, you know, people need to, I think, just be exposed. Not that you're praying for anyone else, but just the fact that you could go out and pray. You know, how about you go out to eat and, and you pray you know, why don't you just pray out loud for God to bless your food and, and whatever prayer you would normally do, and who cares who's around you, and who cares who's listening to you, but I'll tell you what, it would do good for other people just to hear, hey, someone's praying. And you might encourage other people to be able to do the same too. Now, again, the point isn't for anyone else's specific benefit, when you pray to God, you pray because you're praying to God. But the point is more about, I'm going to pray to God no matter what anybody thinks. And I'm going to use my voice because I'm going to speak to God. And if you, you know, unless you're a mute, you know, you have a voice and you ought to use it in prayer to the Lord just as much as we would use our voice in praise to the Lord. I mean, imagine if Brother Peter got up here to lead the singing and everyone's singing in their hearts, right? <laughs> no one's opening up their mouth. It's like, oh, I'm singing too. I'm just, I'm singing on the inside, right? 
It would be kind of silly. And now, now, could you sing in your heart? Sure you could. I sing in my heart sometimes. I'll have so, you know, songs playing in my head and, and kind of just thinking about them. Maybe you get like a little hum or a little something else, but you know, you, you're, you could say, I'm singing, making melody in my heart to the Lord, but the, the, the real purpose is to use your voice and sing, right? And I believe the same thing is appropriate with prayer as well. That we, that sh the norm should be, hey, we're speaking, we're 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 talking, we're we're making our prayers known to God, and it doesn't matter what what people think or hear. Now, obviously, there's times where it is appropriate to just be by yourself where no one can hear you, but even then, talk to God, right? Use your voice. Let's keep reading here, verse number two. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. And here we're going to see another psalm as we, we, I preached, you know, probably within the past couple of months where um, there's, there's some desperation. There's a, there's a lot of, of things going on maybe. And this is a condition where we see in Psalm 77 verse 2, my soul refused to be comforted. Right, like I'm, I'm not, I'm not really getting any comfort at all. I'm just really troubled. My soul ran in the night, and it's not stopping. Right, I'm having this issue where sometimes you might be bothered with something. You pray to God, you might start to feel a little bit better, and 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 you're good. This is a situation where you're saying, "Look, my soul refused to be comforted. Nothing's making this okay. Nothing's just making this go away. I have this problem." Verse three says, "I remembered God and was troubled." I complained, and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. Now, I want to preach a little, touch a little bit on this word complained here in Scripture because we think about complaining always as a negative thing. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad thing. We understand here when we're reading the Bible in the context, I don't think it's ever really necessarily a good thing. It's never like a positive thing to complain. But depending on the context, it's not always talking about what we also see in Scripture as murmuring. Right? Murmuring is always bad. When you're murmuring about something, that is what we would just know as like, man, you're complaining. Like, stop complaining. I don't want to hear all your complaining. What we see in Scripture is that complaining is also you are expressing bad things that are happening to you but there's kind of two different situations that we see. There's one that's not tolerated, and then there's another one that is tolerated in Scripture. And I believe what we're reading in Psalm 77 is that latter one where this is a complaint, but it's, but it's one that's, that's going to be more tolerated based on whatever the circumstances are that are going on. So let's look at a few different examples of complaining in Scripture to just help us to get really clear on, on what would be the difference between the different types of complaining. You can keep your place here, and uh, if you want to turn to Numbers chapter 11, we're going to see an example of bad complaining. Complaining that would actually make God angry. In this psalm, in Psalm 77, I don't think that God is angry with the complaint of the psalmist here. And we'll see another example where I don't think where we could see clearly that it, it's, not, um, it's not something that's going to be angering to the Lord when someone is expressing what's going on in their life. You may be, you know, if you, go, if you have a lot of bad things happening in your life and you go to God and start talking to God about all the bad things that are happening in your life, that's not necessarily like some horrible thing to do, right? It's good to go to God with our cares and with our concerns and with our worries and, and our problems, right? And you can call that a complaint. You can call that complaining. But if it's all situations that are just outside of your control and you have these different things happening to you, you don't necessarily even know why it's happening to you, that's not a bad form of complaining by going to the Lord to, to seek relief from this stuff, right? But what is bad is what's seen here in Numbers 11, verse number 1. It says, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. So here, we hear, God hears people complaining, and it makes them really angry. 
and his, his anger is kindled. He's displeased. It says, And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. So people literally died because of their complaining that God didn't like to hear. And there's other examples of this with using the word murmuring, but we're focused literally just on the word complaining just to show you how uh, that works. Because this is what the people were doing. They were murmuring. They were complaining. They were, this is uh, when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt, right? They're displeased with, oh, there's no food out here. Oh, man, what are you doing with to us out here? You're going to kill us. And I wish we could just have some flesh to eat. And we get, you know, all this other stuff. And they're just complaining, 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 complaining. When God just literally freed them from slavery, right? right? It's like you're, you're taking no thought to what God has already done for you and all the great things and all the miracles and all the kindness and all the mercy that God has just shown you. And you're just being very unappreciative of what the Lord has done for you. That is a bad complaining. That is a complaining that's going to make God angry with you where you just kind of have this bad attitude about you know, whatever in your life, and you have this sort of entitlement attitude thinking that, well, I ought to have everything. It says, and the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. I mean, there's a literal fire that consumed people, and it's because God sent that because people were complaining. So there's an obvious bad complaining. Another one is found in Jude. You don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to um, Judges 21. Judges 21. Jude, verse 16, the Bible says, These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouths speak of great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. This is talking about the false prophets. This is talking about the reprobates, saying that they're murmurers, they're complainers, right? That's another bad form of complaining, one that's going to make God angry. And this is just one of the things that typifies the false prophet right? That they're murmurers, complainers, or whatever, these, these reprobates. Uh, Lamentations 3.39 says, wherefore doth a living man complain? Like, why does, it, why does a man complain? A man for the punishment of his sins. So there's another area where you shouldn't be complaining is when you are reaping what you've sown, when you go and you go out and get involved in some sin, and then you suffer consequences as a result of your own sin, and then you're going to start complaining about that. Like, God doesn't want to hear that. Okay, it's gonna, that's also going to make God angry. It's like, look, you're the one that, did, that, that made this mess. You're the one that got into all of this. Now you have to deal with it. Okay, you go out and get drunk and high and stoned, and you got to deal with some hangover or even worse... Well, look, man, you did it. Don't complain about how you feel. Don't complain about the, the wounds without cause. Don't complain about this stuff. You've already been warned about it. You went out and did it. Now you've got to deal with it, Amen. right? That's the type of complaining. The complaining where you're either being ungrateful and not thankful for what God has done or just not willing to own up for the things that you've done, that is not the right type of complaining. But there's another type of complaint where you can have things happening to you that, uh, again, God will be more sympathetic to and be willing to lend his ear to the complaints uh, in given uh, different uh, circumstances or situations. Judges 21, look at verse number 22. The Bible says, And it shall be when their fathers or their brethren come unto us to complain that we will say unto them, Be favorable unto them for our sakes. Because we reserve not to each man his wife in the war, for you did not give unto them at this time. And this is that, this is that crazy story with um, Benjamin being almost completely wiped out after Judges 19. If you know that story, when then Israel came together and they destroyed uh, almost the entire tribe. And then they needed wives. And then they're like, well, we, prom we vowed we're not going to give anyone our wives. And then they had to go and like steal the girls that were dancing in Shiloh and and, they're, and, and now they're saying, like, look, when, they're, when their brothers and their dads come complaining, like, what are you doing? They can't have my daughter to wife, uh, which would be a valid complaint, by the way, <laughs> to be like, I didn't give my daughter to them to wife. They're, you know, you can't just let them take my daughter. It says that we'll say unto them, be favorable unto them, right? Speak well to them. We're not going to be mad about them complaining about this because... They kind of got a point, right? Uh, that's, that's one example. That's not necessarily the best example because that story is kind of weird anyways. Um, I, I don't think they did the right thing by, by 
making that decree, but it is what happened. It's the truth of what happened. I don't. I, I think they they could have probably done or said or you know something else other than like kidnapping women to be their wives. Uh, I think that's pretty clear. That was not the right choice for them to do. Nevertheless, that's what happened. So, uh, but if you look at First Samuel chapter one, we will see the story of um, Samuel's mother before before Samuel was born. When she was, uh, she was she's praying and wanting to have a child, and um, she was really just just really emotional because she has been barren. And her husband has two wives, and the other wife has children and everything else. And she's been really longing and wanting and yearning to have uh, children and for God to bless her with a child. And she's, she's sobbing and praying, and, and uh, Eli sees her, and she th he thinks that she's drunk because she's just really emotional and kind of mouthing her prayer, but not really speaking well. So it just looks like she's kind of intoxicated. You know how a lot of drunks can, can just be in a really inebriated state and, and not able to, to speak coherently and stuff. So that's what, that's what she looked like, right? And this is where we pick up in the story. Verse 16 says, count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial. She's like, look, I'm not a child of the devil here. I'm not drunk. Okay, that's not what's going on. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. So she's saying, like, I, I, I have an issue. I, I've got a complaint that I'm uttering before the Lord, and I'm, and I'm sad, my grief. I've spoken hitherto. But then look at Eli's answer. He doesn't say, well, don't you be complaining. He says, then Eli answered and said, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou askest of him. So this isn't a situation either where I think uh, um, here the, the, the mother of Samuel is like a, in, a, in, a, in a, an inappropriate spirit towards God, right? Like, like being bitter towards God or angry at God. It's not the case. Her complaint is that she's wanting to have a child. It's, you know, Lord, please give me this child. And she's just upset and and it's considered a complaint because it, she's talking about something that she doesn't have, but it's, it's not like a bad thing to desire to have a child. Does that make sense? And, and um, here we see her actually receiving what she's asking for um, and God showing mercy. And again, now, complaining is never a good thing. We should always learn to be content with such things that we have, but... Uh, you, can, you can sort of see some of the differences here. One last place that we'll look at is in Job chapter 7 and verse number 11. The Bible says, uh, Therefore, I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. And actually, there's uh, multiple places in the book of Job that... that Job is bringing up this word and using the word complain or complaint. And I, I think we can all probably have some sympathy towards Job and what he went through and understand his complaint about, look, I'm doing everything right. I, I'm, not, I'm not involved in any sin. It's not like I'm just reaping what I've sown. Unless, unless you're judging me for the sins of my youth, Lord. Like that, was, that came up where he's just thinking like, 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 is it from something I did when I was really young? Because I, I haven't been doing anything, you know, wrong. I'm not, I'm not in some wicked, grievous sin where his friends were all accusing him of doing that. Yet all of these bad things happen. He's miserable. He's lost his health. He's lost his family. He's lost his wealth. He's kind of just lost everything in his life. And he's just trying to process it and deal with it and, and, and just kind of going to the Lord of, of you know, seeking, what, like, why? What's, what's going on? What, what, what's the deal, you know? That's, that's not some unreasonable thing for a person to have to go through. And we see, again, it's, it's, this isn't some complaint that's just making God super angry with him like he was angry with the children of Israel when they're complaining about the garlic and the leeks and the melons and the cucumbers and all the things that they had in Egypt, right? That makes God angry. But these types of things, when people are going through these, uh, these types of situations, 
again, not that we, not that we should say you should be complaining, but when you're bringing up your concerns to the Lord and, and your issues, that's not a bad thing. Let's go back to Psalm 77. And the whole purpose of that was just to kind of go through as I was bringing up on Sunday, you know, when my sermon on getting wisdom, you know, when you read your Bible, you know, study your Bible, think about the words and be paying close attention to the context because it does matter. And, and, you know, look into the things that you might see like, well, that seems kind of strange. Why is it, why is it talking about that? Well, get the full understanding and, and by going and looking up more of this stuff from, from the scripture to see what it is, because there are times where words aren't exactly the way that they're used today. And over, you know, 400 years, there's definitely some words where the meaning isn't necessarily completely, completely different or wrong, but the, the meanings have shifted a little bit and we want to be wise. We just want to understand more just really clearly what is being stated in scripture. That was the purpose of this exercise here. It's not to just justify complaining. Okay, so don't, don't leave tonight going, yeah, Pastor Burson's like, yeah, you know, it's cool to complain sometimes. It's like, no. No. It's not what I'm saying. Be content with such things as you have. Psalm 77, look at verse number 4. So again, getting back into the spirit now, uh, the context of the psalm. My soul refused to be comforted, right? I complained, my spirit's overwhelmed, going through a lot of hard times. Verse 4, thou holdest mine eyes waking. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I mean, this is really upsetting. This is, this is being a really bad situation. My soul has no comfort. There's nothing that's comforting me, and I can't even speak. I'm just so upset. I can't speak. But then look at verse number 5. I have considered the days of old the years of ancient times. So one of the things that we ought to do when we have such bad things or bad problems or whatever it is, we don't see specifically what's going on with the psalmist here. We don't know what it is. And for the purpose of the psalm, it doesn't matter what it is because we go through our own times and troubles where you can see you're not getting any rest. You're, you know, you're so troubled you can't speak. That's good enough to understand whatever is going on there, when you are in a similar type of situation, then it's time to consider the days of old, the years of ancient times. Look at verse 6. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart, and my spirit made diligent search. So now it's time for introspection. Looking in. Looking to my heart. Like, well, like, I need to make some diligent search about this because I'm so troubled. I don't know what's going on. And it's going to seem as well in this one like God's not here. God's not helping me. I don't know what's happening. So let me look inward. Introspection is very important. Evaluating, considering God's ways in the Bible with your own problems. And no matter what's going on, I, you know, we, you ought to make it a habit. I try to do this. Again, nobody's perfect, we need, but we need to be able to remember these things. When you have the hard times, the first thing you should be looking at is yourself. Always. Always. Because you don't want to be getting chastened for something and especially then be ignorant of it. Right? Now, oftentimes, if we're going to be chastened to the Lord, we probably already know why. Right? Because you know what you do. Generally speaking, you know when you do wrong. But it is possible that you might have just allowed yourself to really be overlooking some area that you should know better, but you've somehow justified it to yourself, and, and you haven't really been considering that you still might be involved in, in, in some sin that God has to, to chasten you for, rebuke you for, and bring you low and humble you for, so in these bad times, the best thing to do is just to be a like, stop and I'm going to look inward again and see, is there something that I'm doing wrong? Is, is, am I at the cause of all of this? Am I bringing this on myself because of my sin? Because I've, you know, and, and take stock and, and evaluate, like, what am I doing? Am I doing something wrong here? 
And, and would to God we could all be in the place where Job was where we're saying, like, look, I didn't do anything wrong. And he's confident to be able to say that, like, this isn't, I'm not receiving this level of, of persecution because I'm involved in some really wicked sin. Like, that's, that wasn't the case. And he could just boldly say that. And, and we ought to be able to say that too, but it's still worth considering and thinking about and going like, man, what, you know, what have I been doing? Where has my heart been leading me? What have I, you know, am, am I at fault here? And, and that is a wise thing to do where you think about, consider the days of old, you think about the ancient times, you think about how God has been, how has God dealt with people in the past? What does the Bible say? and look in to yourself. Verse 7 now goes into this whole, the next few verses, talking about God. Um, well, let's just read it. Verse number 7. Will the Lord cast off forever? So when, when, when God is dealing with people or punishing, well, am I just going to be cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Like, is God just completely going to just shut off and just not show goodness anymore? And, and is this going to be what I have to deal with forever? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Notice forever, forever, forever. Like, like is this just going to go on forever? And sometimes this is how you feel. When your soul is not comforted at all and you're, and you're going through this hard time and you just kind of start thinking like, man, like, what have I done? Is, can, this just, can this just continue forever? Like, like, will I just always be dealing with this? Is this, is this always going to be the state that I'm in? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Selam. This is, again, a difficult place to be when you start to even question these things, right? Because when you're not going through the hard times, you're not questioning God's mercy very much. Right? Like, I, I know I'm not. I mean, when things are just going well, yeah, I mean, praise the Lord. It's mercy endureth forever. You, you know, things are, things are great. And to be honest with you, I mean, maybe I'm just, just been super blessed, but like, I don't find myself in a position like this very often at all where things are just so extreme, like, like just no comfort, I can't even speak. Have they happened? Yes, but this isn't something that's just kind of a regular occurrence for me. Now look, I'll admit, I believe I am, I'm just thankful that I haven't had to be in this position a lot because I'm sure there are plenty of people who have been in positions like this more frequently, okay? But the truth is still the truth. Regardless of how often you find yourself in this position, you know, this is something that, but the reason I'm even bringing all that up is because it seems obvious that God hasn't forgotten to be gracious when you aren't the one going through the problem, right? I mean, it's like, of course God doesn't forget. Like, what do you think? God, God doesn't forget his mercies. Like, of course he's gracious. Of course, you know, of course he hears, of course, you know, like, to the one on the outside, it's easy. But to the one on the inside, these things really are thoughts that's, that's going, I don't know if I can deal with this. I, you know, I, I, what is going on? But we can't forget who God is. So as we continue to read now, of course, we, we progress past these thoughts in verses 7 through 9. Verse 10, And I said, This is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. And, and this is key when you're in that condition in such a, a, a bad spot to remember who God is. And we know who God is from the Scripture. So we're going to see now, the, kind of the rest of this chapter is, you know, the light has come on. This is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders 
of old. I'm not going to forget that God is merciful and that God is great and that God is gracious and that God has done many wonderful works and that God has saved his people and that God has done all these things. I won't forget that. I'm going to remember who God is and that he is a God that saves and he is a God that's our defender and our buckler and our shield. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. So this is a turning point in this psalm from going from my soul has no rest to saying, look, I'm going to remember how great God is. I'm going to remember all the good things that God has done. And no matter who you are, God has done good things for you. So when you're finding yourself thinking about all the bad things and wondering, God, I don't know if I could take this. Hey, start thinking about the good things that God has done in your life. Think about what God has saved your soul. Think about what, what, whatever God has given you in this life and meditate also of his work and what he has done and talk of his doings Amen. and and remember and get back to that point where you can be like uh, uh the the apostles were in acts chapter 4 i'll read that story for you uh the bible reads in verse 18 and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of jesus but peter and john answered and said unto them whether it be right in the sight of god to hearken unto you more than to god judge ye for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard like, we have to speak these things. We can't help it. We might, and, and here's the thing. In Psalms, it's like, look, I'm going to think back on all these works and be like, yeah, I'm going to speak about them too. I'm going to talk about it because God is great. Amen. Because the goodness of God is greater than all. It's, 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 it's something that's worthy of talking about. And yay, I have to talk about it. I can't keep this uh, locked up inside of me. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. There's this, this prompting to, 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 from within, because you have that new man, that new spirit, the Holy Spirit to help guide you, to, to, to help you through these problems, but also just the, the prompting to speak. Look, we believe, so I'm going to speak. Let's go back to, to, you probably never left Psalm 77. So now we're going to see a little bit of a list of all the goodness from God. We just got done saying, hey, look, I'm going to remember your works. I'm going to remember your wonders. I'm going to meditate of your work, and I'm going to talk about your doings. And now here's the talking of the doings. Verse 13, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. And keep that in mind. We're going to get into that at the end of the sermon here tonight, which we're, we're approaching a little bit closer. Um, thy way is in the sanctuary, as we would put it in church. Who is so great a God as our God? Amen. Thou art the God that doest wonders. Now, we're going to see more here, like thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Thou hast with thine arm, redeem thy people. And, and see a lot of things that God has done. But I like how it starts in verse 14. Thou art the God that doest wonders. He's not just the God that did wonders. He's the God that doest wonders. God continues to do wonders. God is still all powerful. It's not that God is a God of all the things of the Bible, which are all in the past. And those are all these great things that were done. Look, God does do wonders. Even to this day. But you know what? God doesn't do the wonders for the people who don't care about him at all. I mean, he's already done wonders for those people, which were you and I before we got saved. He's already done the wonder of that, the wonder of Jesus Christ coming and dying on the cross and being resurrected from the dead and conquering death and hell. That was a great wonder. And that wonder is done. And that's the wonder that was done for everybody that, reject, for, that rejected Christ, that didn't have anything to do with Christ, that sinned against the Lord which included all of us, okay? But the wonders that continue to be done as the wonders that were in the New Testament, like, oh, hey, uh, he perceived that he had faith to be healed, right? And, and how many times did, did Jesus ask people, well, do you believe that God's able to do this? And then he heals them, right? And that, that connection with the faith and the healing and seeing the miracles and that, you know, Obviously, there's the great picture of in order to really receive your healing, you need to have faith. But physically, even at the same time, we're seeing the same thing play out. 
So yes, God is a God that does wonders, but you know what? You ought to be believing in the God that does wonders if you want to see the wonders in your life. Amen. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. So this is, again, going back to the wonderful works of God in remembering the old time that we were just reading about in the context here, Psalm 77, verse 15. Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. So you've saved your people. And how many times has God saved his people? Right? God saved his people over and over again. Obviously saving them out of Egypt, but then even in battles, even in wars, even against enemies, against the heathen, you know, multiple times over and over again. Verse 16, the waters saw thee, O God, the waters saw thee. They were afraid. The depths also were troubled. The clouds poured out water. The skies sent out a sound. Thine arrows also went abroad. The voice of thy thunder was in the heaven. The lightnings lightened the world. The earth trembled and shook. And this is, these are all just signs of, of the almighty God. Just all representative of, of the things that just no human can control and some of the biggest forces in the world. All of this is happening at the, at the presence of God. The voice of thy thunder was in heaven. The lightnings lightened the world. The earth trembled and shook. Verse 19, thy way is in the sea and thy path in the great waters and thy footsteps are not known. And then the last verse here, verse 20. Thou ledest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. We see a lot of the presence of God bringing things that we also might consider turmoil. The earth shaking, lightnings, clouds pouring out water, the skies sending out a sound, right? These are things that frequently can get people fearful and afraid and uncertain and not knowing what's going on. That doesn't mean that God's not there. In this situation, God is there. Right? That is happening because of God. And sometimes we confuse God not being there by our life when God actually is there in our life. And we still may not understand the, 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 what's, what exactly is happening, but don't forget who God is. And don't forget how God works. And don't forget that people are allowed to go through, through things but you're never going to be um, put in a situation that's above that you can handle. You're never going to be tempted above that you're able to handle. There's always a way out. There's always going to be a way to escape. Uh, some you might have to go through worse than others. You can read Hebrews 11. There have been people, you know, believers who have been martyred and tortured and gone through all manner of evil things on this earth. But they were righteous. They were good with God. They were, they were right. They, it wasn't their fault. It was just a testimony to the Lord, but they still were, were, you know, faithful to the end and God will elevate them and lift up their name, which is why it's called that hall of faith because there's people getting a lot of praise and, and the Lord lifting up the, the great heroes of the Bible who have suffered and gone through uh, bad things, horrible things for the cause of Christ. Remember who God is and, and remember that, that, you know, Nobody, no wicked doer or evildoer is going to go unpunished forever. Know that whatever, hey, when you reap wickedness, you're going to, or when you sow wickedness, you're going to reap the same. You know, the Bible's not specific on those who, who uh, sow to the wind, reaping the whirlwind, whether that's a believer. You know, it's just like, look, man, you, you might be messing around. Anything that you sow is going to come back, you know, at a much greater volume. That's how seeds work. Any seed, I don't care what it is, the plant always grows up much bigger than that little seed. And, and you're good, you're bad, whatever it is that you're, you're, you're throwing out there, the, the works that you're doing, 
it, it does come back. So that's why, again, we always look to ourselves. But then we consider and we know who God is. You're over worried about God not being there. You think God's not around. You know what? We can see how God works. We know about God. We know his miracles. We know his wonders. Uh, we know his goodness. And that should strengthen you and comfort you to keep moving forward. And even with all of these things happening, whether it's a lot of turmoil going on, hey, God's way is in the sea, like it says, his path in the great waters, thy footsteps are not known. But it says, thou leddest thy people like a flock. So all of that may be going on and God's leading his people. All, think about all the astronomical events that are going to happen when Jesus Christ comes back. The, the, the sun's going to be darkened. The moon's going to be turned into blood. The heaven's going to depart like a scroll. Stars are going to fall from heaven before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And then Jesus is going to lead us all like a great shepherd out of here. So it may seem like a very scary, it will be a very scary time. It, is, it just, it is. There's going to be people being, being uh, uh, martyred and stuff, but... You know, thou lettest thy people like a flock. In, in, in this context, of course, he's talking about by the hand of Moses and Aaron, right? So referring back to Egypt and, and being let out of that bondage. But that was how God works. God performed great miracles. God redeemed the people. God showed his great strength. God led the people. But also don't miss this. And, and I remember I mentioned earlier about thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. That was from verse 13. Thou, talking to God, God led the people like a flock. But how did he do it? By the hand of Moses and Aaron. God gets the credit. God is the one that brought the people out, right? No doubt, no, no argument there. But how did he do it? Moses and Aaron led the way out. So it, it, they couldn't have done it without God, but God used men to do that. The leading, the, 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 the guidance, God was using man the whole time for the whole flock, for everybody. And so if you go to Ephesians chapter 4, God uses human instruments. Don't ever forsake church. Don't do it. I, it's, it's so frustrating, the people that just want to have a bitter or bad attitude. I don't need some man to teach me anything about it. I could just sort of worship God in my house, and I don't need to go to a building, and I don't need to go, you know, it's like, look, why don't you humble yourself? Why don't you recognize that uh, God's way is in the sanctuary? Why don't you recognize that and, and remember the ways of old and remember who God is and remember that God led the people like a flock by Moses and Aaron and remember what happened when the people wanted to come up against Moses and Moses is humble and he's just like, look, man, like, like I'm nothing and Aaron's nothing. Why are you coming against us? God is the one leading you, but they didn't want to recognize that, and they're just bitter against Moses and Aaron. And they want to, have the, the, they want to be in charge, and they want to run things. And God gets angry, and with some of them, you know, he opens up the earth, and they go straight down to hell. These people trying to be rebellious and, and starting this, this whole opposition movement against uh, these men of God, God's the one leading them out. But Moses and Aaron are the ones that God has chosen to do it. You want God's leading in your life? Great. So do I. I want God's leading in my life. And I want God's leading in your life. And it's not that I'm anything special. And it's not that Moses is necessarily anything special. Or, you know, individually as human beings, not anything special. Okay? But if God is going to use people and he's going to use the way that he ordained things to be, the way that he said that things are going to be, then maybe we should just respect that and respect how God set things up and just have a little bit of faith and say, hey, maybe if I come to church, I can grow. I can learn. I can uh, uh, be used of God. I can understand more. I can, I can grow and do more for the Lord because I'm going to be obedient and understand what the Bible is even teaching here. And don't forget how God has worked in the past. Look at verse 7 of Ephesians 4. 
but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. I'm reading all this just to get the context about the gifts. Verse 11 is where we get into this. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ." from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working by the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. It sounds to me like there, there's, there's, this, uh, um, there's a great need to have a unified body Amen. and that God has ordained that there would be uh, uh, apostles and evangelists and pastors and teachers to help the whole body, to help the whole church, to help people to grow for the perfecting of the saints, for all the work to be done. And look, that is found in the local church. Amen. That's why there's qualifications for elders, for bishops, for, for deacons, for people to help in the administration to do the work that God has for us to lead everyone in the right way and to, to follow me as I follow Christ and to just help everyone to benefit. And there is, and I don't care what anybody says because I've experienced this enough in my life, you humble yourself enough to go to church. I've learned so much more in church than I have outside of church. And, and I look, after reading my Bible, you know, there's things that just, it's not that you always necessarily have to be, you know, physically present, but things that I've heard in church still reinforce the reading and the teaching and everything else at home, Amen. right? Now, there's plenty of things I've learned in church. There's things I still learn in church, even when I preach, believe it or not. It's amazing how God can bring things to your mind and... You know, I would hate for the day to come where that stops happening. Because if that stops happening, it's not because I know everything. <laughs> it's because I'm doing something where God's not going to show me things anymore. And I need to get things right. So that's a scary place to be in, right? Look, if you are sincerely seeking and yearning and thirsting for the truth, God's going to give it to you and you're seeking that wisdom and you want to have it, God will give it to you. But you have to be thirsting and seeking for it. You, I mean, you, 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 gotta, you gotta put forth some effort. I mean, can you at least make it out to church? And obviously I'm speaking to people who made it out to church tonight, but you know. <laughs> Don't forget that though. And it's funny that people have the worst attitudes about going to church are usually the people that have the weirdest, most screwed up doctrine. I think, I'm sure I've shared a story in the past, but it's, it's an old story. It's from a while ago. I, I ran into a guy, and he was just, just boasting about how, oh, I've, been, I've tried all the churches here, and this was in Arizona, in, in Prescott Valley. I tried all the churches here, but I just, I just know more than all the pastors. And this is what he's, this is what he's telling me. Like, no joke. He's, he's just saying this to my face. I don't, it doesn't even matter. Like, I, don't, I don't always introduce myself as pastor or anything. It, it doesn't matter, right? But he's just saying this stuff. And I'm just like, oh, wow, really? Oh, okay, yeah, so you really study your Bible? You know, just, just, just talking to him, not, not talking down to him and not, and not trying to cause any problems, right? Even though this guy's really full of himself, I'm trying to still, like, get to the gospel. And man, oh, man, this guy, he was okay with talking to me, invited me in, but he started going off on the serpent seed doctrine, and, and everything else, and it's like, you mean to tell me you literally think that Eve had a physical relation with that serpent? Because this is what he's saying. 
Eve had a physical relationship with the servant, with the serpent, <laughs> and produced Cain. Like that's where Cain came. That's not, that wasn't Adam's son. That was the devil's son with Eve, and Eve was a mom. Isn't that weird? Like that's just, see, this is, oh, you know way more than all the pastors in this area. Sure you do, buddy. And, and, and here is his thinking. He's like, see, look, beguiled. You know what beguiled means? Because it says a serpent beguiled Eve. Like, yeah, he deceived her. He tricked her because that's what the word means, beguiled. You, you tricked somebody, right? You used guile. And he's like, no, no, look. And he gets out of Strong's Concordance and he's like, see, look, deceive, trick. I'm just like, yeah, that's what I said. And, like, no, but, and, and, and it's, um, then it's seduce, right? It's like the last possible synonym. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah, in a context of beguile, you could, a man could beguile a woman to, you know, but that's not the context here, <laughs> You're weird and perverted to think that it is. But he, I mean, he hadn't been to church in decades. And I forget the exact number. He, he told me how long it was. It had been a long time. And it's because he knew more than everyone else. That's what the church is for. And so you're not children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men who lie in wait, you know, with their, with their cunning craftiness, lying in wait to deceive and, and deceive people into thinking stupid things like that because they don't know their Bible and they just need to get their rear end in church and humble themselves and listen to the preaching of the word of God and grow and learn in truth and get into the place where God would have you to be, where God is doing his work, where God is leading in the sanctuary. Don't forget who God is. Don't forget God's ways. Don't forget these things, and especially in the times of need, when your, your soul is, is refusing to be comforted, and you have so many things going wrong, don't allow yourself to think foolishly of going, you know, is God just going to cast me off forever? No, you're a child of God. He won't. Jesus said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. You're, you're not, you're not going to just be tossed aside like you're nothing. Okay? Even though you may experience some things that are extremely unpleasant, that is not how God is going to operate with you. We don't always understand the way things work, but we know that God is the Savior. We know that God is the Defender, and we know that God is there, and that God will show up. It's just not always on the time and at our beck and call whenever we demand that God be there, right? So we continue to call on the Lord, looking for our help and not losing sight and not losing faith and and. Honestly, remembering back to all the good things and all the great works of God will help your mind and your attitude when you're feeling like God's not there. Go back and remember the good and remember what God has done. It will strengthen you and help you. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this great psalm. Thank you for the great truths in your word. Thank you for being there for us. Thank you for hearing our prayers, Lord. There is so much. I could go on all night thanking you for your goodness, Lord, because your mercy endures forever. Help us never to forget that, Lord, and to uh, remember the great works that you've done and then, and then go on to, to not even be able to help it, but be able to speak of them because uh, they are worthy of praise. Lord, Thank you again from the bottom of our hearts. Lord, please help us. Please help anyone in our congregation. Uh, if anyone is going through a, a, a very difficult time like this, Lord, please strengthen them. Please help them to feel your presence and know that you're there. Those who are dealing with loss and sorrow, those who are dealing with extreme grief and uh, maybe extreme health problems, Lord, help them to know uh, your graciousness and your kindness and your mercy, dear Lord. And I pray that you please help us to continue to speak of all the good things that you've done for us, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.